In a world of Democrats, there will be time for them to make profits. Now's not that time. And Republicans have abandoned free market principles to save the free market system. You need a voice of liberty. Look no further. You found it. Tom Woods. Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 370. Hold on to your hats for this episode, my friends. What I love about doing this show is that here we are at episode 370, and we're still covering brand new topics. And this topic is going to blow your mind. I would be willing to bet that maybe even 90% of my listeners are unfamiliar with what we're going to cover today. And those of you who are familiar with it, I bet could stand to have a refresher. So it's really the ideal topic. I myself could stand to have a refresher on this topic. What is the topic? The topic is something called argumentation ethics advanced by Hans Hermann Hoppe as a defense of libertarianism. And it is a bold defense. You'll notice that the title of this episode is equally bold, saying that it is impossible to argue against libertarian principles without engaging in a contradiction. Very, very bold, that claim. And we're going to try to defend it with Stefan Kinsella, who is a great theorist on this subject in his own right, a great explicator of Hans's views. Stefan has many credentials. I'll just note that he is the founding and executive editor of Libertarian Papers. You should check that out. We'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 370, a series of scholarly papers in the libertarian tradition. He's the director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom and the author, among other books, of Against Intellectual Property. It's 2015 as I record this. April 9th, I'm going to be at American University and April 11th at the University of Cincinnati. I hope to see some of you guys at those events. Get the details on those at tomwoods.com slash events. And now, my conversation with Stefan Kinsella. Get ready, everybody. Stefan, welcome back. Hey, Tom. Glad to be back. Other than Hans Hoppe himself, who generally does not do audio interviews, so for everybody saying, why don't you get Hans on the show, let me take care of that one right now. I, I have asked him to, uh, back when I was hosting the Peter Schiff show from time to time, I asked him to be a guest, and he politely declined, not because we're not friends or anything, but he just doesn't want to do audio interviews anymore. And he says, plus, you know, sometimes I say things and I get into trouble, and I'm whatever, and I'd rather just write out my answers. So... That's another matter, but there's really nobody else I'd like to talk to on this more than you, and you've, you've written an awful lot about the subject that we're talking about today, which is argumentation ethics. Now, it is highly fashionable in libertarian circles. Well, let's say it's fashionable in fashionable libertarian circles to discount this altogether and to make fun of Hans and to make fun of people who believe in it, but the arguments for it, if I may say so, are actually very intriguing and, to my mind, quite strong. What the claim that Hans is making is an incredibly bold one. I mean, it it took Murray Rothbard's breath away. It was so bold. In effect, he's saying that it is impossible to argue against the uh, basic libertarian principles, the first user principle, homesteading principle, private property. It's basically impossible to argue against these things without engaging in a contradiction without contradicting yourself because there are principles that are pre-argumentation that are taken for granted that are presupposed by the very fact of arguing a very fact of engaging in argumentation the very action of doing that that can't be denied without engaging in in uh, in contradiction it's it's a it's a strong claim and yet to my mind it really works so t- t- is that have i correctly described hans's aim I think you have, and uh, yeah, I think you could. Uh, you could. I would proudly call myself uh, uh, Hoppe's uh, libertarian consigliere, if you want, like the libertarian uh, <laughs> lawyer advocate uh, yeah. for a lot of Hoppe's views, because I've learned and you've learned a lot from Hans. I view Hans Hoppe as the greatest living uh, libertarian theorist and Austrian economist um, in, in the world. So um, w- there's a lot to learn from him, and. One of the first things that he 
burst onto the scene with in if I have the timeline right, I think he came to the U.S. around 19... Uh, 86. Uh, 80, 80, yeah, 85, 86, and he was with Rothbard for about a decade until Rothbard died. And around 86, 87, he started promoting this argumentation ethics idea, which is just one of his many um, breakthroughs in Austrian and libertarian thought. And um, it was very... Uh, uh, provocative and controversial when it came onto the scene and around – I think the first time it was really noticed by a lot of people was in this Liberty Magazine symposium in 1988, um, and he introduced his argumentation ethics, which was a kind of a new defense of libertarian rights, which Rothbard loved and went crazy about. Um, so yeah, that's how it came about, and that was the origin of it. You are a libertarian legal theorist in your own right, so why don't you just explain very simply what are these libertarian principles that we're eventually going to arrive at, just so that we can see the goal that this is all taking us toward? Well, and the, and, and actually this argument helps us to see what the libertarian principles should be, and that's a dispute in itself or a, right, like a debatable right, right. topic. But libertarian principles, you know, you could call it voluntarism, you could call it peace, you could call it prosperity… Um, I think if you distill it down to its core, what libertarian principles are is that we're trying to come up with a set of rules that people can live together among each other right, in a world of scarcity and the, where there's a possibility of conflict. And these rules are what are called property rights, and the property rights are usually assigned or delegated in a certain traditional way. You know, The first person who gets a thing gets to own it. If you sell it to someone by contract, then they're the new owner. These basically simple rules are the core of the Western legal tradition and of all human society. The project for libertarians is to be more consistent about it and to enumerate like what the justification uh, could be. And up, up until, I'd say, Hoppe's time, there have been two or three main ways of trying to justify um, the legal system that we see. And these have been what, the typical means that we're familiar with. I mean, for example, the, you're talking about the natural rights tradition? Yeah, I'd say so. The two main ways would be the natural rights or what some people call the ontological or principled approach. And there's many, there's many uh, variations of that. And then the sort of consequentialist or utilitarian approach. Uh, you could say there are others like uh, uh, intuitionist, uh, religionist, um, and there's a there's a libertarian anarchist named Jan Lester, J.C. Lester, um, who thinks there's a third version, which he calls uh, this kind of Karl Popper versed uh, based uh, critical rationalism, which is that you just you you, you come up with conjectures and you just try to de uh, to rebut them. Um, what you know, like Rothbard is. Mostly in the natural law, natural rights tradition. Um, what Hoppe argued was that there are problems with the two main approaches to justifying norms or rules or ethics or laws or rights, and that is that the one approach, utilitarianism, of course, is completely incompatible with what we understand about economics given Mises' understanding of – the fact that values are subjective and values can't be quantified. We can't compare values, so we can never come up with a rule that that would allow us to maximize some kind of value parameter in society. So this kind of strict utilitarian idea is is economically unworkable, and it's also unethical because even if you could take money from, let's say, Bill Gates and give it to some poor person and make them better off, that doesn't automatically show that the, the theft of, is justified. So utilitarianism is is, is criticized, um, and natural law theory, natural rights theory, is heavily bound up with the Catholic Church and with the religious views. And there are two principal criticisms that are that are that are set forth uh, against the natural rights view. Number one. It's the Humean idea that you can't derive an, an ought from an is. That is, you can't make a factual statement and then derive from that what should be the case or what laws should be the case. You can't just say, here's what human nature is, and therefore this is what the rule should be because you have to introduce a normative statement, and you have to have some kind of 
independent justification for that normative statement. Um, so that's one problem. The other problem that people like Hans and others have identified with the natural law argument is that human nature is very vague and diffuse and very general. So even if you agree that human nature gives rise to a set of prescriptions and laws, they would be very general and vague. They wouldn't be specific at all. Um, so what Hoppe did was – Hans was a leftist initially, a German leftist, and he studied under one of the most brilliant philosophers uh, of the modern time in, in Europe, uh, Jürgen Habermas, who's a leftist. But he – Habermas and his, his, his colleague uh, Karl Otto Appel, right, these two German philosophers, had come up with this thing called discourse ethics. And the idea is that if you want to try to find out what ethics, what normative rules in society could be justified, you have to look back to the source of any kind of uh, method of proving these things in the first place, which is always a discussion between two intelligent beings like you and I are having right now. Okay, that's good. And I was going to ask you why is argumentation central to the whole thing? This is why. Yeah, and so what Hans says, and this is a, a hard to recognize until you think about it, but what he says is that human action itself is not the source of these things, but human communication is. And the reason is that when you have humans come together in a community, in a society, and they have a, 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 an interaction like a discourse, the discourse has certain – presuppositions, what he calls them moral or normative presuppositions. In other words, you could not have a discourse about what rules are good or bad unless everyone agreed to put their, their swords down in the first place and sit down together and treat each other with respect and dignity and treat each other like e each one is, is, is the owner of themselves. Otherwise, you couldn't have a communication with someone. So what he points out and what Habermas and what uh, Appel pointed out is that there are normative presuppositions of argumentation and the fact that the only way you could ever come to a decision about what rules are good or bad is through argumentation means that whatever these normative presuppositions of argument are, they matter. They just matter to what you could argue for in the argument itself. So as a simple example, you could never say… Hey, Tom, let's you and I get together, and let's, let's debate whether we should ever have human society. Let's debate whether we should ever be able to talk to each other. By, by having a conversation, we're sort of both agreeing that having a conversation is a good thing. Having interaction or social intercourse is a good thing. So there are certain things you could argue, you could say that would be incompatible with the presuppositions of the very endeavor that has to be there to justify – any norm ever at all. So that's sort of the general background framework. And then there are other uh, features. I mean, now now we should unpack what other presuppositions exist in in this whole package of argumentation. And of course, the in effect, when you're engaged in rational argument, you are, if you know, if I may give the punchline away a bit, you are being a libertarian. Whether you realize it or not, when you engage in argument, what are you doing? You yeah. are inviting someone to consider your arguments on the basis of a standard that is common to you both, namely reason. And if you if you engage in argument and you're 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 advancing your claims, you are implicitly saying that you prefer I mean, you've got potentially a dispute with another person as you try to justify your position. But you prefer a peaceful resolution. That's why you're engaging in argument. So are, the very fact of, of, of embarking upon argumentation already presupposes a preference for nonviolent resolutions of conflict. So that, that's also very important. And then also, since arguments yeah. are not just floating in the air, but they're made by human beings, there are also presuppositions that come out of that, the fact that I have to stand somewhere to make the argument and so on and on. So spin these out for us, if you would. Right. So yeah. So 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 what Hoppe is pointing out is, and actually Hans Hans characterizes his argument as sort of a hybrid between a consequentialist and a uh, a sort of um, natural law view. It's natural in that it relies upon human nature, the nature of humans as being a communicative, language bearing 
being that has that, that we have to communicate with each other and we have to discourse with each other to establish truth. Okay, so it's natural in that sense, but it's more much more narrow than the traditional natural law approach. Um, so, so the particulars of this argument is that Hans argues, and I agree with this, and he basically abstracted away all the social democratic gloss that uh, Habermas and uh, Appel put onto their version of it because they have this bizarre philosophy where there's world one and world two and world three, and to get truth, you have to have social democracy, and then there's, there's welfare rights introduced. I think Hans's view is that basically Habermas and probably Appel had a, a crucial insight, okay, but they – they perverted it towards their their socialist European ends. Okay, he took the crucial insights, stripped them away of all the clutter, and combined it with what Mises saw, right? Which is the idea that we have we have to live in a world of scarce means. We live we live among each other. Rationality means something, right? So basically, what he said is, when you have a discussion about what norms could be justified, I mean, look, this is the basic bottom line of the argumentation ethics approach. The bottom line is that it's like a filter. It's like any ethic that you could ever propose would have to be discussable and arguable in discourse among humans. And if it contradicts the, presupp the normative presuppositions of the debate that everyone has, it has to be rejected. So libertarianism emerges because of a filtering mechanism. That is, every unlibertarian ethic is rejected. And every libertarian ethic can survive the filter. So it's it's not like a positive argument. It's an argument by a filtering mechanism. And the argument is twofold. It's that, as you said, when two or more people are engaged in a discourse, they're engaged in cooperation in a peaceful activity. Okay. But the second re recognition, which he did get from uh, from Habermas. Is that argumentation is also a practical activity. This is an activity engaged engaged in by living human beings with physical bodies in the physical world of physical scarcity, and they had to get there somehow. They had to survive somehow to be able to argue. They have to survive during the argument, which means there's a, a recognition of the significance of the ability to control and use scarce resources in the world. You have to use water, food. <laughs> Land, resources, you had to get there somehow, which means no one in, in a real argumentation could deny the value of the ability of someone to pluck an unowned resource out of the wilderness and start using it. Otherwise, the human race never would have survived, and we never could have this conversation in the first place. So when you combine all these things together, what you get is sort of a… Uh, a transcendental – some people some people call it a transcendental approach to what is really common sense. Right? The common sense approach to libertarianism is sort of the Mises consequentialist approach, which is that if you value life, if you value human society, if you value your neighbors and yourself, and if you have a, a degree of modesty and honesty and economic literacy, then you would have to support… A free market system because you know that's what's going to get you what everyone really wants. Right? The consequentialist case for libertarianism, according to Mises, I think is perfectly sensible, but it depends upon this hypothetical if, if, if thing, if you value life. But the fact is that most people do, and everyone does pretty much. And the people that don't, we have to regard them as enemies and dangers and just regard them as part of the external world. So what Hoppe is trying to do is to show that not only is this approach practical, not only is it reasonable and intuitive, but that there is no way to argue against it. What he's trying to show is that if you argue for any kind of crime or socialism, you could never sustain that argument in a real way because you would have to do it in a setting in which you're respecting other people's rights, in which you're being a libertarian as you say. All right, I want to go through a couple of uh, principles that the filter either weeds out or causes us to realize we need in any ethic that is going to pass muster. So the first one would have to be 
it has to be – if we come up with some norm for establishing property rights, for example, it has to be one that's conflict avoiding because we've already indicated our preference for, for conflict avoidance in the very act of argumentation. So when we look at different possible systems, let, let's suppose we had a system where verbal declaration – was sufficient to claim ownership of property, that's obviously not conflict avoiding because I could shout that I have ownership of something and you could shout that you have ownership of it, and then we would we would fight over it. So that would that couldn't possibly work. So eventually you get to the idea the idea of the modified idea of, of Locke, modified by Hans, that the only possible system would be the first user uh, type of system, the first person who uses a previously unowned good is the owner of that good. If we if we had a system where the 12th user were the owner of the good, then what would the first 11 users do? Stand around and starve to death? Because only the owner is allowed to exercise control over the thing. So that's that's the, something, conflict avoiding. But also the one I want you to, to talk about is universalizability, that any norm that we might propose has to be universalizable. What does universalizable mean, and why does argumentation require that these norms be universalizable? Right. Yeah, and, and these these are. I mean, look. To be honest, everyone knows me as Mr. IP, and to be you and you and I both know this is not my favorite topic in the world. It's just one narrow topic that's um, gotten interest. But I love this kind of stuff. This lit my brain on fire in 1988 or whatever in law school. Um, I just and I still think this this whole approach to rights is electrifying and 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 it's it's, it's amazing. Um, Look, it's not about um, <laughs> it's so. So the, let's take universalizability. Okay, um, the idea is that when you give a reason, you're giving a reason. In other words, we we really have a distinction between violent conflict and people trying to solve problems together. When you try to solve a problem and you try to have a discussion with people, let's work out a solution to the problem. Okay, and there's already a problem because we wouldn't be having a discussion otherwise. And the nature of the problem usually helps to define the scope of the property rights at issue. In other words, what people disagree about defines the boundaries of the property right itself. Okay, universalizability is the idea, the Kantian idea, which is why a lot of the Randian types I think reject this idea. And and I don't know if we have time to get to this, but we could talk about why. Papa's idea, uh, which is still around and still popular, but it was rejected by a lot of the prominent libertarians at the time. Um, yeah, I would. Like I think to talk that's an interesting. Yeah, but, but yeah, yeah, let's do this first. Yeah, yeah. So the universalizability thing, to my mind, universalizability. Let me let me just kind of define it without being too philosophical. It's the idea that if you if you propose a rule or a norm. In a conversation that should be the rule governing in a given context, that that rule could be universalized, that it could be applied to everyone. And so it's, it's, a, it's like another filter test. If you propose a rule that could not be universalized, like here's my rule. Um, all redheads should be killed. Well, that rule is actually universalizable, but it's arbitrary. So you have different filters to reject these rules, right? Um, I think the ultimate reason for the universalizability rule, which is that if you propose a norm, you need to give a rule that is grounded in the nature of things instead of being a mere arbitrary or verbal decree, as you mentioned earlier, because otherwise it could not serve the purpose that is that it's destined for, which is to solve conflicts. If you have a conflict, that means there are at least two people that both seek to use a given scarce means in human action. Okay, and unless they want to physically fight with each other, then they would prefer to have a system which allocates an owner of that resource. And then we need to determine, well then what's the rule that determines who the owner is, right? So if we had a rule like uh whoever says loudest I can own this resource, that would not solve to reduce uh, conflict because anyone could say, I own the entire continent of the US. I planted a flag on this state and whatever. So the traditional rule, the Lockean rule, was always 
you have to physically transform the resource. Now, I think there are some problems with Locke's original approach. He, 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 he's too religious, and he also mixes in this labor idea too much, which led to intellectual property, by the way. But he was responding to Filmer, and he was trying to come up with a way to justify a natural system. I think a more sophisticated modern version of the Lockean approach, the, the, the Hans Hoppian neo-Lockean approach, would be recognizing that the, the, the importance is on embordering. Hans calls this embordering. That is setting up a system of borders or public uh, boundaries that people can recognize. Um, in, in a sense, I think the term private property is, is, is a little bit perverse because property – is really public in the sense that the purpose of property rights is to set up a border that other people can observe so they can know this person has a claim to that resource. I can respect their property by avoiding the invasion of that boundary. So property has to be public, but for this to work, these links, there has to be a, a visible, publicly accessible connection between a person and a resource. Okay, And that cannot be a verbal claim because anyone could make the verbal claim, and then you could have a million people claiming to own this resource. That's why it can't be a mere verbal decree. That's why Hoppe emphasizes the importance, and so does Locke in, intuitively, right, of having a, a, a physical connection to a thing, a historical connection. You're the first person who used it, and in a sense, this has gotten… Uh, uh, less appreciation than I think it should have, but I think one of Hoppe's greatest insights was the extreme importance of what he calls the prior-later distinction, which is that someone who comes first has by default a better connection, a better claim to the resource than someone who comes later. If you didn't have that assumption, you would not have property rights, and you wouldn't have the ability to homestead property in the first place. No one could ever do anything with anything. Um, if you see an unowned resource in the, in the wilderness, if you don't have the right to go use it, right? no one could ever – the human race could not have prospered and survived. So there has to be a right to be the first person to take the thing, and then if you don't have the right to keep it, that means there's no property rights. So this all feeds together, and it implies – that anyone engaging in any civilized societal activity, any discussion with each other, we all recognize the importance of the prior-later distinction, the importance of being the first one to use a thing, the importance of being a contractual uh, owner of a thing after someone else gave it to you. And all these things, if you combine them together, result in the libertarian… Uh, uh, vision, which we have, which is that we should have a voluntary society where people basically live and let live, cooperate, and respect each other's things. Let me say one word about universalizability, and then I want to raise a couple of common objections. I think another way universalizability uh, plays a role in argumentation ethics is that every proposition that I advance in argument has to be at least conceivably acceptable to the people I'm talking to, or otherwise it would defeat the whole purpose of an argument. There has to be at least the plausible chance that what I'm saying could then be accepted by my listeners. And if I say, uh, for example, I can hit you, but you can't hit me, there is no conceivable way this norm would ever be accepted in argument. Now, it's, it's, that's not to say, by the way, that I couldn't have a rule uh, authorized personnel only in, in this room. That, that seems like it's not universalizable, but it is. I mean, if you happen to be authorized personnel, you can go in there, but this is for your safety. We don't want you to get blown up by the, the equipment that's back there. But there, at least there, there's, we can see what the reason is for the restriction. But if I simply say, as a socialist would, I can hit you, but you can't hit me, there is just – there's no chance that that could ever be universally accepted in, the cor- in, in discourse. And so, therefore, it's ruled out. I mean, am I also on the right track there? I think 100 uh, percent you're on the right track. I, th- I think that uh, 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 the entire point – and I got off track earlier uh, on the universalizability. The entire point is that you have to give a reason, and the reason you have to give a reason is because we are talking together, and we're trying to persuade each other 
as Hoppe calls on the force of reason alone, instead of like saying, I want you to agree with me that Star Wars is the best movie ever, and if you don't, I'm going to shoot you, right? Then that's not a real <laughs> discourse or argument. In a real discourse where we're trying to find the true nature of things, we're trying to find a legitimate rule that, that we should all agree to, that we have to appeal to things that are objective. And this is the you know this is the, the really thing. That's why he says you have to be grounded in the nature of things. So if you can point to a reason to distinguish, you can. I mean, look, the ultimate logic of libertarianism and of human freedom and of Hoppe's argumentation ethics is that you and I are talking to each other, and we know we're similar in most respects. And I'm claiming rights to my own body and my life because I don't want you to kill me. And there's just no rational reason to say that you don't have the same rights because for whatever reason I have these rights, whether it's religious, whether it's intuitive, whether it's consequentialist, whatever, whatever reasons I have the rights to my life, I cannot deny that you don't have similar rights to your life because you're similarly situated to me. Now, if I can show that you just shot my wife or you shot my, my dad or you just did something horrible to me… Now I have a reason I can point to to treat you differently than the normal case, but in the normal case, there's just no good reason to treat people differently, and when people claim rights for themselves, they have to admit that other people who are similarly situated have different rights. This is why the Greeks and why the early Americans maybe made the made racialist arguments, right, like uh, you know um, uh, Certain people are barbarians. They're not the same. So they were trying to appeal to a natural reason to say some people don't have full rights. They're not like Greeks or white people or whatever. Right? The argument is wrong. We know that now. But you understand they were at least trying to find a distinction to justify treating people differently. All right. I want to shift gears and ask you a couple of uh, – raise a couple of objections that I have seen raised. Here we are talking about argumentation as a filter. We're talking about uh, principles that are presupposed in argumentation. So we've talked about conflict avoidance, universalizability. There's also respect, as we've said, for the other person's bodily integrity because if you don't have that respect, you're not engaging in argument. We're not even doing what you know, what you're supposed to be doing in argument. So we have respect for bodily integrity. I, To have a body at all, I need to nourish myself. I need standing room. So there are a whole bunch of things that are presupposed here. But it's been said uh, two things. Let me see if you can answer these two things. First, couldn't it be the case that you would need this uh, respect for your bodily integrity only during the process of argumentation? But once the argument is over, then I can tax you at the level of a social democracy and do whatever I want. But while, while you're arguing, I have to stand there and treat you nicely. And then secondly, you could say, as you have, that we need food and nourishment to keep us going for, for any argument to be possible. Okay, but couldn't you have just enough to argue, and then I could take some of it and give it to the poor? So how would you answer those? Yeah, so actually I think those are actually the two strongest kind of arguments against it. But the strange thing is, especially in the first case, they're made by libertarians usually. So let's think about this. Here we have libertarians, and the, the bases of libertarian thinking is varied. Some of them have really no argument for libertarianism. They just are libertarians for some reason. They just prefer the liberty values that underpin our, our view. Some say they're consequentialist or utilitarian. Some think they're natural law types. Um, but the point is… For, among our fellow libertarians, they agree with us. They agree… They agree that there's a good reason not to have a rule um, – well, there's, they agree there's a good reason to have a rule that pro prohibits aggression, let's say. Now, whatever their reason is, they think that an argument that permits socialism basically, which is the invasion of other people's property borders, they think that's bad. And the people that oppose the argumentation ethics approach… So they're saying that the argumentation ethics approach is wrong when it says that we you can't have an argument for socialism, even though they agree with it themselves. 
So I'm always befuddled. I'm 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 not as befuddled by socialists and outsiders, but by fellow libertarians that oppose the argumentation of this approach. I'm never quite clear what their ob- objection is. Do they really think that it's possible to make a consistent argument in favor of socialism? I don't think so. So if they don't think it's possible to make a consistent argument for socialism, they're leaning in the direction of the argumentation ethics approach um, you know, in the first place. All right, so how about the couldn't we give you just enough food to be able to argue, and then after you've done that, then we can tax you all we want? Right. So the the way I think about it is this. Um, you have to have a context of, of how we're having this argument in the first place. What What is a dispute about? And And as I said to you earlier, most people that disagree with this are libertarians, and they actually don't believe that the food should be taken away from you. They don't believe in your subsistence rights or whatever. So their objection is, is odd. I think it's probably a combination of – um, they don't like holes being poked into their natural law theories or their utilitarianism uh, by a newcomer like Hoppe. He's not a newcomer anymore, but whatever. Um, as for the subsistence idea about the food, once you so, – so Hoppe starts with this. He says that let, let's talk about the human body. We all have a body. Uh, we are identified as individual people with a body. You know, He's not taking a religious stance about whether you – as C.S. Lewis said, whether you're a soul that has a body or whether you're a body that has a soul or rights, it, it doesn't really matter for libertarian theory that there is a definite identity between an individual and their body, Okay, and there's a definite direct control between a, a person and his body, and that is the fundamental reason Hoppe argues in one of his, in one of his articles, one of his arguments, that um, people have the, the primary right to control their bodies because they have the direct link to their bodies. They have the best control, the best demonstration of the link to their bodies. Okay, And then he argues by analogy that let's take the human body as a prototype, as a prototypical example of a scarce resource. Whatever rules we agree upon for the human body, naturally we would assume they would apply to other types of things that are similar, which are other scarce resources in the world. So the argument Hoppe would advance, and which I agree with, is that the same reason that you have the right to control your body extends to scarce resources in the world. And so you couldn't just artificially limit the argument and say it only applies to the narrow set of conditions needed to sustain the argument. That's just an example of exactly what people have to agree to for those cases. However, any dispute in human nature over any resource – let's say – let's take a, 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 let's take a resource that's not necessary for survival and for the argument to happen, some kind of – some resource out there. Still, that resource could be the subject of dispute, and the only time we could ever determine – Who's going to have the rightful control of that resource would be when we engage in, phys- uh, in, in actual argumentation. So in other words, even the dispute over these luxury resources, you might call them, would have to occur during argumentation. And during the argumentation, the people have to advance universalizable reason. They have to give a reason. They're trying to say, I should have the right to control this thing instead of you. They're not just hitting each other over the head with bats. They're not being cavemen. They actually have entered into the realm of discourse to find a reasonable solution to this problem. And when you do that, you say, we all agree we would be better off if we agree to a rule that assigns an owner to any disputable resource, even the luxury resources. Okay? And when, when you agree to that, then you have to agree that we have to advance reasons for these rules, which is why universalizability enters into the picture. Okay, And that reason has to be analogous to the original prototypical examples, which is the body and the resources needed for basic survival. There's no reason to treat them differently. There's no reason that you say if there's a dispute over a diamond, which is just a luxury object… That someone should get it because of verbal decree instead of the person who actually mined it out of the ground and, and or contractually purchased it from someone else. 
There is just no argument that you can come up with that would give it to someone else that would support a socialist connotation of the world order that could survive scrutiny under a reasonable dialogical process. Let me uh, read a short passage from an article I will link to on the show notes page. We're going to link to a lot of stuff on this. TomWoods.com slash 370, 370. We're going to link to a lot of stuff on this material because it's great, interesting, very important. This is an article that you published over at Libertarian Papers by Frank Van Dunn, and he's referring to an argument by David Friedman, who's been on this show a couple of times. Uh, He says that David Friedman argued in this famous uh, symposium in Liberty Magazine that you referred to about Hoppe's uh, argument about argumentation ethics. David Friedman argued that Hoppe must be wrong when he claims that self-ownership is a prerequisite to debate because countless slaves have engaged in successful argumentation. However, Hoppe did not make the empirical and absurd claim that a person is incapable of arguing merely because the powers that be legally classify him as a slave or that being the legally recognized quote-unquote, owner of one's body is a necessary condition for being capable of engaging in argumentation. His argument was that such legal classifications and the actions they sanction or legitimize cannot be justified in an argumentation with the slaves or indeed in any argumentation that takes the presuppositions of argumentation seriously. And of course, there's no argument being made here that argumentation is uh, an amulet or it's some species of magic. It's not, well, this can't be. This person argued and he's still you know, enslaved or whatever. It, the point is that you can't make the types of arguments that are ruled out by argumentation ethics without engaging in self-contradiction. And presumably, people want to avoid engaging in self-contradiction if they have respect for reason. He notes in a footnote, by the way, uh, to this uh, point that David Friedman tried to make, that that countless slaves have engaged in successful argumentation. He says, note the ambiguity of the word successful here. How many slaves have successfully argued their way to freedom? Well, okay. So here, here's here's uh, here's my uh, thought on that. First of all, I really admire Friedman. I've learned a lot from David Friedman. Me too. But he is an he is an inheritor of his father's positivism and his monism, um, um, and uh, look, Hoppe, in my view, is a pioneer, and I do believe in my. I, I wrote an article in a, a, a law review in 1994. About Hoppe's book, and I, I mentioned that he was a little bit unclear conflating uh, uh, positive power with rights. And he by, by the way, the book you're up. talking about, I want to just make clear for everybody: the book is the theory of socialism and capitalism. No, it was his second book. Oh, the it economics was, uh, and ethics of uh, private property. Yeah, I'll so that's that the one too. I reviewed. Okay. Yeah, and so I mean, I I thought it was an amazing book. I think it's an amazing book. I think yeah, Hans is a pioneer in this area. He was basically <laughs> breaching new territory, and I think he he could have clarified his terminology in a couple of areas. But where his critics seized upon him and said this means his whole thing can be rejected, I think I think you could easily correct it and clarify it. It's not a big not not really a big problem. Um, the slave example, for example. Um, First of all, here we have David Friedman, who's an anarchist who presumably opposes slavery, just like I and you and Hans and every good person does. Um, I don't. I, so, what's the disagreement really? Is Hans Hans's argument, if you formulate it as I try to do in my many attempts to uh, explicate it and defend it, um, it's rooted in this universalizability principle, which is that. You cannot treat someone differently without a good reason, okay? But what that means is that two people trying to get together to solve a problem or a community trying to solve a problem, we all presume that we're in sim- that we are similarly situated. We all have rationality. We are all humans. We all are dealing with the world's scarce resources. We all want to live together in society. Then we have to formulate rules that take this into account. This does not mean that you can't take into account the fact that sometimes things are different. So, for example, um, if I wanted to enslave you, I couldn't have a good reason for that because I am claiming freedom for myself, but I'm saying that you don't deserve freedom even though we're similarly situated. Okay, The only difference would be what what 
the opposite of universalizability is called particularizability. Like everyone says, it's just me. Like I can hit you, but you can't hit me. And everyone knows that would never be an argument that could work, that could help or achieve any kind of consensus that could help us all live together. Okay. However, if you have a reason to treat someone differently that's grounded in the nature of things, then you could appeal to that. That's objective. That's what the Kantians call intersubjectively, uh, uh, you know, ascertainable. Ascertainable, right? Okay. So, if someone has actually committed an act of aggression against me. You know, let's let's say some guy attacks your farm and he's going on a rampage, shooting your animals, shooting your people. You might imprison the guy for a little while to just keep him under control. So he might be in a jail cell in your house until you call the local uh, legal system. I don't know. And you might have a conversation with the guy, and he might say, how can you justify keeping me imprisoned when you're free? And the answer would be because you just attacked my family. <laughs> in other words, there's a reason. And so the point is that the fact that slaves can factually argue with people, and even sometimes in a just situation, doesn't imply that Hoppe is wrong. He might have overstated when he said that you can't argue unless you're free. Um, it's possible for a slave owner, a master, to own a slave… And to have an argument with him, it is true. It is true. But he could not justify the enslavement of the slave unless he had a good reason. If they're equally situated, he could not come up with a reason that he's just a, he, he's he's keeping the guy enslaved. You know, that's the main argument. Well, and then he goes on to say, Van Dunn, consider on the one hand a master who enjoys debating the justifiability of slavery with his slaves after dinner, and then sends them back to their cage, no matter what the outcome of the discussion may be. Consider, on the other hand, a master who frees his slaves after being exposed to the argument that slavery is not justifiable. Which of the two takes argumentation seriously? Which of the two acts as a rational being? You know, so that. So anyway, he's got this is a this paper really needs to be read too. Um, he he says no one should take this type of argumentation seriously because it's not a genuine argumentation, but. Anyway, we've gone on quite some time, and I, I want to let people digest some of this, and I want to, anybody who is intrigued by this, who thinks, okay, I think there's something here. There's a core of something here that I want to know more about. I want to refer them to tomwoods.com slash 370, because there you'll see quite a number of links to what Stefan has done on this subject. We'll also take you to the original writings by Hans himself and some other material. So this will be your one-stop shop for learning more about this subject. Uh, if you, do you have any parting words for us, Stefan, as people go out and, and venture to learn more about this? No, the, the, uh, the only parting word I would say is that the, the essence of libertarianism is to be honest, to be for liberty, to be, to be in favor of your fellow man's uh, well-being, to be consistent, to have a little bit of economic literacy. And all those things are the really the basis of any consistent libertarian person's uh, view of the world, and that's completely compatible with and complementary to uh, Hoppe's approach to argumentation ethics. So I would suggest people just consider a little bit um, philosophical uh, approach to undergirding their basic intuitions about liberty. Well, Stefan, I appreciate your time helping us to understand this. Uh, I, when I first read Hans on this as a, I don't know, a college student, I confess I didn't understand it at all. And then I read your explanations of it, such that when I went to go give a talk on this in Philadelphia, I gave a talk on right, various rights theories— Ten minutes before I went on stage, I was on my cell phone, desperately calling you, saying, "All right, wait, wait, have I got it now? <laughs> have I really got it?" You were the guy. I remember. I, to... I remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. That was about. Yep, I remember. Yeah, Thank you. That was about. I think that was two thousand nine. You can dig that up. Uh, I think it's a series of videos on where do rights come from. And then I talk about argumentation ethics in one of the lessons over at uh, RonPaulHomeschool dot com in my course on uh, government. So I have you to thank for helping me to understand this and for spending time with us today. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, everybody. On the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 370, not only will you find many resources related to the subject, 
we covered today, but I'm also linking to the free ebook I keep telling you guys about called 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered. It's a good, meaty ebook. It'll give you a lot of good arguments to help you in debates, and you can get it for free in a Kindle edition, in EPUB, and as a PDF, whatever you prefer. So please check that out on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 370. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.